And like all these areas, we have a number of challenges. You know, we have a rapidly changing global economy. You all, I can only say the word China, and you will know what I'm meaning about that. We get new competitors. You know, 10 years ago, nobody heard of a company called Huawei and telecommunications. Today, they are the second largest provider of telecom equipment. Uh, nobody heard about Geely in Sweden three years ago. Now they own Volvo. Uh, we have tight capital. Yes, the banks are making record profits, but I presume they keep handing it out to management rather than to make it available to SMEs. Uh, so one of the issues we have to do is to find other ways of sourcing capital, specifically for startup companies. And in the Scandinavian environment, we have never had a lot of venture capital. We don't belong to that culture. And by the way, we think venture capital is not very nice because it's incredibly expensive and you lose control. So we want capital that provides market validation and is patient. We use lead customers as a source for capital. It's one of the most common sources for growing small companies. We need flexibility and nimbleness. We need to be able to change. We need to build our portfolios. Yes, you are a sub-supplier in the automotive industry today. Keep doing that, that's fine. But also add to the portfolio the ability to manufacture things for the medical devices industry. They are desperately in need for the skills that exist within some of the companies in the automotive industry, which has excellent management practices and tools. We have a fairly unforgiving business environment. You know, it, you know, failure is not something that um, is easy to come back from. And it should be easier, but that's the way it is. We have this ever-increasing speed of technology development. We need to keep a reasonably on top of that. And we need to build new capabilities, and I'll come back to that. Design being one of them in Australia that I would strongly uh, recommend you to look at. And we need new ways of doing business. And if we don't do this, if that is something we forget, then um, as a state, you will suffer. As a country, you will suffer. And you will suffer because others will do well. This is, a, this is not a zero-sum game, but it's a game about what share of the growth will you have, which is important. Now, if we look a bit at the company level, um, and I'll tie them together after that. I'll show this picture. When we talk about innovation, which is the key driver of economic growth on company levels, we talk about innovating around three dimensions. We talk about technology-based innovation, design-based innovation, and business model innovation. But they serve different functions. Some of these, these two primarily, is about increasing the value you create. We can create a lot of value. But then, we need to make sure that we get the value and not the next guy in the supply chain, right? So it's something about how we can appropriate this value. How can I grab, grab this value I created to me? And that is this dimension, and that's about the business model. And you think about that. Some industries are very, very good at creating value, but not very good at grabbing it. And other people are not very good at creating it, but are very good at grabbing it. Example, retailing. Retailing can create a lot of value by pressurizing the suppliers to generate a very low price. But what do they do with this value they've just created? Well, they give it to you, the consumer. In other words, they create value, but they don't appropriate it to some very high extent. If they did appropriate to a high extent, they would not operate like Aldi does on an average net margin of 0.8%. You don't make mistakes at 0.8%. Whereas one of the owners said when he was asked by the business journalist, how can you accept a negative return on capital or whatever it was, because it's a privately held company. There were two brothers and two halves of the company. But one of them said, I don't care what the return on capital is as long as I get a billion dollars a year in my pocket. Yeah? And you can say that if it's a privately held company, but you can't if you're a listed company. And we see, actually, the emergence of more and more of these large privately held companies because they tend to have a more long-term view on life than the listed companies. Examples of a private held company, which is very good from where I come, is the one just opposite the airport called IKEA. They went into Russia, and the CEO was asked, the owner actually was asked, so when are you going to make a profit here then? And he said, I don't know. I have no idea. So when, why are you going in here? Because it's the right thing to do. Can you imagine a CEO of a listed company saying that? I don't think he might keep his job for very long if he did that. 
So there is a difference of the working environment. Technology is key, we've spoken about it. It is around delivering on the desired changes to your business model and making more money. But what we see now is that you need to have many technological areas under your control. This product, Nespresso, in order to make that decision on how to produce that and how to go about it, this firm, well, it's a big company, it doesn't matter, they needed to have excellence in food innovation. That means they need to understand biology, chemistry, sensory biology, all these kind of things. Right? Then they need to understand precision engineering around how do you actually precisely engineer anything from the plastics to the, the metal around these things. And they need to understand packaging and where packaging is going. And by the way, packaging is one of the fastest developing technology areas. If you haven't heard about the concept of printed intelligence, you should look it up. It's around conductive inks being put on paper in a way that we can produce electric circuits. We can even print a charged battery that can be involved in packaging to an extent where this can do things you would only dream of and totally change the packaging industry. And this is critical. So this success required all those things. And once they had the capability, understood how to do it, then they can decide if they want to actually do the manufacture, outsource it. That's a secondary decision. They need to understand all these things to get to this first point. The second area is design. And if I may be so bold, I would say that design is frequently misunderstood. People generally, when we say the word design, they associate it with jewelry and fashion and all this kind of stuff. From an industrial standpoint, that's completely irrelevant. Design is, in a sense, an optimization process on a system level. So let me try to illustrate that with a silly example, simplifying world. If I am an engineer coming from the other side of this, tech, from the technology side, and you tell me, reduce the water consumption in this building, I will go about it by putting in intelligent little widgets, like taps that you put your hand under, the water comes on, and then I take my hands away and the water goes off. So I put in these tools on a kind of atomistic level, on a very small level, to reduce water consumption. If I come at this as a designer, I step back and I say, how can I change this layout of this building so that the behavior of people would change so that they would use less water? It's a fundamentally different approach to things. And the objective from an industrial standpoint about design is to design something so that your behavior change in a way that you like so that you get locked into my product. Have you seen um, the small children? They come up to the TV screen and go, right? They have been exposed to a very successful design, a design that has changed their behavior, a behavior which they like to have because when they see that nothing happens, they get fed up and go back to the computer where something does happen around these things. So design has this objective, and it's about an optimization process, normally between form and function, and normally between what we call surface context and deep context. So I want something that you can use, but I want it to be recyclable, or I want something you can set up for yourself, but I want you to be able to do it without instruction manual. That is design very critical, and actually in Australia, severely underutilized in the manufacturing sector. In Scandinavia and Switzerland and Germany, heavily utilized in the manufacturing sector. It's actually one of the key skills in manufacturing in these countries is to have design. It actually was the underpinning issue around the reorganization of the university in Finland, where they merged the design university with a technical university with a business school, because industry required people who still have their core skills, but understood the other two so they could work in joint teams. This was not the idea of the academic community. They hated it, and they're still resisting it with all their force in their merger, right? It was not the idea of the, gov the government, but government listens to industry, and when industry said, we want this, government said, yes, sir, turned around, pointed at the academia and said, do it. Okay. So that is the underpinning logic why you have Alto University. The third and most critical component around these things is business models. And business models is how you set your business up to take as much of the value you create as possible. And let me give you some examples. Let me start with a simple issue around understanding your customers. Because if you don't understand your customer, you cannot do this. So I'll give you two quotes. Okay. 
Black and Decker making hand drills and things says last year one million quarter inch drills were sold, not because people wanted quarter inch drills, but because they wanted quarter inch holes. Right? Now, that is actually quite a blinding insight from a CEO. In other words, very rarely do we sell things that people want in themselves. What they want is what the thing can do for them. Now, if you think you're in the business of selling drills, one of the services you may add is a financing service to simplify the procurement of the drill. But if you know that people want holes, what you will sell is the ability for somebody to rent somebody with a drill to come and make a hole. The latter one is much more successful business-wise than the former one. But it requires that insight into the customer. The other one, of course, was this, which was the basis for Harley Davidson's successful turnaround. What we sell is the ability of a 43-year-old accountant to dress in black leather, ride through small towns, and have people be afraid of him. <laughs> All right. And that captures the insight of this, this product. It doesn't say motorbike anywhere, right? You know? This is a kind of a midlife crisis person who is a white collar exercise and who suddenly needs to have other things going. But understanding this has a lot of consequences. It tells you, where do I need to put my outlet? I need to put it where my customers live, which is in good suburbs, not next to the prison. Okay? That's a big misconception there. Right? The second issue is to understand when I need to be open. I need to be open on weekends, not in weekdays, because these guys lose it on weekends, mostly. Right? It also means I can sell company products, which I, I have a favorite, which is a washable tattoo. Okay? So you can come in on Friday and get yourself all kitted out, you know, with the bad-looking things. You know? Have your leather vest on top of that, and then off you go. And on Monday morning, you step into the shower with your expensive soap because you can't look like that when you come to the board meeting. You know, it's impossible. Huh? And you can charge a lot for that. So that's a service added to your product, which is valued by the customers because you understand those customers.